Last week at this time, Lenore and I were visiting with our son and daughter-in-law in Nashville and enjoyed that time, and we're thankful to be able to take that time for family. One of the greatest things about uh, this time of year, I know many of you will feel the same as, as do I, uh, is just getting to spend that time with family that we don't generally get to spend. And in conjunction with that, I ask that, that we each one continue to do our part to remember the fact that uh, there are those in our number and those that we know of who don't have family that they used to have. Uh, that have, for one, in one way or another, have, have lost or have gotten to a point in their lives where uh, family isn't close, uh, whatever the case might be. And, uh, and I think it's uh, a good measure, something that, that good people should do, is to remember those during this time of the year who may not have what we have. And so whatever that looks like for you, I, I just ask you to remember that. And we're certainly going to strive to do that as well. As we uh, come to the end of our series from the Gospel of Luke called Why Jesus. Uh, we're going to talk this morning about a, an eccentric, outlandish, interesting character named John the Baptist. And we'll be in Luke chapter 3 if you want to be turning your Bibles there, if you'd like to follow along with some of the things that we'll be looking at there. In our series, Why Jesus, we've started at the, at the end of the Gospel of Luke and worked our way in reverse towards the beginning. And we'll uh, finish up Lord willing, at the end of December uh, with, this, with this study, our, our purpose for going backwards has kind of been asking why. What's the reason Luke decided to put where he did the stories that he, that he gave us? And we've looked at a number of, of uh, motifs, a number of, uh, of directions that Luke went. His, we've looked at his focus on uh, service to the poor. Uh, we've looked at his, his focus on Jesus as the, the poor Savior. And we're going to continue to do that a little bit even this morning and as we, as we move forward. But we've also looked at the bigger picture, the seeming as if Luke, as he's going through, this, going through his gospel, is addressing his, his Gentile, his Greek readers. And he's answering their question, their big question that they would ask of him as he tells them the story of Jesus is, why Jesus? Out of other gods and goddesses that we have to worship in our time, why would we want to serve Jesus? Why would we want to worship him? And why would we want to worship him to the exclusion of all others? And Luke gives ample reason again and again and again why Jesus is the one, the one who's worthy of our worship and worthy of our praise. Last week, Neil talked about Jesus being tempted just as we are. And that may be being one of the reasons that Luke would give to show that Jesus in his, in his fully man part was tempted just as we are tempted. Today we're going to look at one of Jesus' closest, uh, closest uh, followers, his family, a guy named John the Baptist, someone who is associated with Jesus. But if somebody comes up and asks you, tell me about John the Baptist, it's usually not a very long conversation, is it? As we look through Scripture, he's in every one of the gospel accounts, one of the rare parts of the Jesus narrative that we find in all four gospels. And yet in every gospel account, there's just not much about him. We don't know a lot about who he was or what he did. Some of that's been filled in for us a little bit uh, by history and, and by historians, but we don't know a lot about who John was or, or what he did, what he was about what we do know, though, makes us imagine that he might have been a pretty interesting character. Out in the wilderness, the uninhabited land between a lot of it along the Jordan River, we, we uh, gain uh, some perspective from Scripture saying that he spent a lot of time around the Jordan River. Uh, we imagine that it was probably just the area that he was was just north of the, Jordan, of the, uh, the Dead Sea down towards where Jerusalem would have been. Uh, and also a place that was uh, home to some of the Essene communities in that area. And we'll talk about that uh, here in, a, in, a, in, a, uh, in, in reference to John and what that may have meant to him. But we know that crowds of people came out to, to meet him. They were interested in hearing what this eccentric man dressed in camel hair and eating locusts and honey might have been. Can't imagine, we don't, again, we don't get the specific reasons. John doesn't address why he dresses as he did, but 
We can imagine in those days that it was kind of a, a protest to excess, a protest to those who were rich and how they treated the poor. And so he dressed as one would dress who was very poor. His diet certainly reflected that. He lived off the land, right? Uh, grasshoppers and wild honey. How would you like to take a, a grasshopper and, and dip it in a little honey and, and put it down the hatch? Uh, don't, know that, don't know that that's something that I could do. Um, has anybody ever, just for fun, I'm, I'm interested, just tried that? You ever, I, I'd be interested in hearing what it was. Lee, have you ever, not, not ever? I mean, you, you, you kind of live out there. I don't know. It's, it's Arkansas. Let's, uh, let's, let's, let's face it. No, I, I'm, I'm curious as to, I, you know, I've, I've seen chocolate-covered bugs and some things along those lines, but I've, I've never, never tried that myself. Uh, seen it cooked in other, other countries, seen, you know, TV shows where people are eating things like that. Again, just not something that we would find appetizing, and it wasn't, as, as we know, the experts tell us, that wasn't normal back then either. That wasn't normally what people ate. Uh, and so he would have been looked at as someone who was interesting. Someone who was eccentric, and yet, hordes of people followed him. Crowds followed him to the extent that when the authorities in Jerusalem were trying to figure out what they would do with him, they were afraid that if they did anything about him, that if they tried to punish him, if they tried to, to chastise him, if they tried to hold him back or restrain him, that the crowds would simply not hear of it, that they would revolt. And because of that, they were afraid of him. Have you ever had someone in your life like that who was just a little out of the ordinary? Not, not someone who was a bad influence on you. I'm talking about maybe in a good way. But someone who was just a little different, who was a little strange. Someone who maybe had a great impact on your life for one reason or another. I had a couple of friends at, at Harding who might have fit that, might have fit that way, that slot in my life, and, and both of them had the same name, interestingly enough. The guy who was my RA on, on the second floor in, in Kendall, in the, at the dorm in Harding where I was, he, he was the RA, he was in charge, his name was Mike Ballard. And he was a, he was a great guy, he was a Bible major, uh, he was very laid back, uh, he, gentle, kind, that sort of a fellow, which maybe wasn't the best fit for an RA, but that's what he was and it's what he did. Then there was another guy who came a year after I had been there, and his name was also Mike Ballard. And he was, all, he was opposite, though, of what the other Mike Ballard was. This Mike Ballard, and I found a picture of him, uh, a more recent picture of him on, uh, on the Internet today. As I was thinking about him, I wanted to, to uh, look and see what might have been out there. But, but this is my friend Mike. He was in Little Rock for a while. I don't know if he still lives there or not. Uh, one of the things that struck me about him instantly was he didn't look like the rest of us. He had kind of a, when he came to Harding, he was, he kind of had a modern hairdo and he was, uh, he, he was a New Yorker uh, from upstate New York, had an accent from up there, talked real fast and which didn't affect me too much, but some of the other people looked at him a little strange because of that. But he's also a, a gentleman who, a man who'd come from a very worldly past. He was a little older than most of us. He had certainly come late to the Christian uh, understanding, uh, and mu much of his life, much of his early adulthood was spent in uh, what we would call a hedonistic or a partying kind of lifestyle where he lived. He worked basically to supply his, his uh, the drugs and alcohol that he and his friends used uh, on, a, on a fairly regular basis, and he was fairly open to talk about the experiences he, that he had had in that lifestyle. In fact, he was the one who told me that, the, that when he and his friends were using drugs, one of the things they talked about most was religion. And they talked about Jesus specifically as they, as they were doing whatever it was that they were doing at the time. And I thought, that, my, that has to be an interesting conversation. I, I, I can't imagine what that was like, but he kind of described that a little bit. But he also said that that didn't have much of an impact on him spiritually. They could talk about it. But it wasn't until he met a man that was running a, he, he was running a gym a time where he invited some of the young men from, uh, from his area to, to come and play basketball with him. And this man was a Christian man. And Mike and some of his friends were really impressed by the life that this guy led. He played basketball with him, but he also talked to him about his life. And Mike began to 
talk more to this man about, about his life, about kind of getting away from some of the things that he had gotten really, really involved in to the point to where it was starting to scare him and those who loved him. And as they began to study the Bible, Mike started to discover some things that he hadn't seen before about this man, Jesus. The clarity of sobriety caused him to think about what Jesus means and who Jesus was to him. And Mike changed at one point in time, decided he had to change everything in his life. And so he gave up the partying lifestyle, and he decided he was going to go into some kind of ministry. And to do that, he moved to Searcy, Arkansas, which you can imagine coming from the New York area was very different for him. Decided to come to Searcy, Arkansas and study the Bible like he had never studied before. What struck me about Mike was his passion, the on fire that you could see in him as he approached the study of Scripture. I remember one night he, he burst into my room and my roommate and I were there studying something that we, I don't know, whatever it was we were studying at the time. And he says, man, I'm, I just read a thing in the Bible, something in the Bible that just blows my mind. He said, did you see that right here in Romans it says that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. It means that while I was off partying and doing the things that I was doing, he loved me. He cared for me. He wanted to see me serve him. Can you imagine that? And he goes, did you know that was in the Bible? Oh, yes, Mike, I did. I've, I've been learning that since I was a kid. You know, that was, uh, that's something that's pretty familiar to me. And we were taken aback by just the, the fire that he had, the passion that he had as he brought that. He didn't see that. But once he saw it, he was like, wow, that's amazing. You know, I didn't know too many people at that time. It's, it's still, I mean, think about it. How many people do you know that, that come running into a room after reading a passage of the Bible exclaiming it like that? He was different. He made a difference in my life as I began to see his fire. That fire was contagious, and it was something that helped me. It was formative to me, and it helped me to go in the direction that I went. As I imagine what it would have been like to see John the Baptist, I wonder if it wasn't something about his passion that drew people to him, a passion maybe a little bit like Mike, something a, a little different, a, a different take on something and a passion about it that drew people out of the big cities and out of the surrounding areas around Jerusalem to, to make a, a long journey out into the wilderness. It wasn't a short, a short walk or a short stretch from Jerusalem to, uh, to the Jordan River. It would have taken several hours to a couple of days to make that journey, depending on how you were traveling. People wouldn't have just casually gone out. They had to go out and plan to be there for a while. But they wanted to go out to hear this, this man, this, this man dressed in strange garments, eating strange things. He must have had a, a different kind of look to him. And yet when they got out there, they heard someone who was convicted with a message. Someone who had a powerful message for them and wanted just to share it with them. As they arrived on scene, and as, you, as Robin read for us earlier, the message that he had was a little shocking, right? As he arrived on scene, his first comments to some of them was, you brood of vipers, calling them poisonous snakes. I don't know. That, that, was, uh, that had to have taken some of them aback. And he called them, and he called them to repent of their life style and how they were living and the things that they were doing. And he said, you need to repent because it's urgent, Something's about to happen that means you need to be in the right place because this is the right time. People must have asked, who is this guy? What's he about? And as we look at that too, sometimes we ask, who is this person? Who is this John the Baptist and what was he about? Again, we have a little information in, in Scripture and there's some information from historical sources that we, that we have that might help us understand a little bit more about him, but when it comes down to it, we don't know a lot about him. We know that he was, he was the son of, of Zechariah and Elizabeth, and there's a couple of different spellings of Zechariah, depending on which translation you use. We know that an angel, the same angel we, we hear that told Mary that she would have a, a baby, first told Zechariah that he would have, that he and his wife would have a son, and that they were to name him John. You remember the story, Zechariah struggled to believe what was happening there, even though it was an angel telling him, and that he was made so that he couldn't speak until he finally told everyone that the boy's name would be John, and finally he was able to speak again. We know that he was a relative of Jesus. We don't know exactly how they were related. We're not given that information, but when the angel told Mary that she was going to have a child, 
He also informed her that her relative Elizabeth was, was pregnant and would give birth. We know that Mary went to visit Elizabeth while both of them were pregnant together, which also tells us that his age would have been roughly the same as Jesus's. They would have been, they would have been uh, together in terms of age, but from what we see or from what we can read, they didn't spend a lot of time together when they were young and when they were growing up. At least we don't see that. We know they lived in different places. Zechariah and Elizabeth had to have lived closer to Jerusalem and Judea. And we know that Jesus grew up most of his life in Galilee, which was a ways off. Not all that far by in our terms of travel, but in terms of their travel and expense, it would have been a very far, it would have been a long journey. Uh, and they would have seen each other only occasionally, if at all. So they may not have known each other well. We also have some, some uh, information from history that John was likely a member of the Essene sect of Judaism. We had the, some of the, the three primary groupings, that religious groupings that they fell into were the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes. We know that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were among the ruling class of the, of the Jewish people. Uh, and and they, had, they were the religious elite of the day. They kind of called the shots. The Essenes were a separatist group. They drew away from the cities and towns. They wanted nothing to do with, uh, determining, with determining what the law said or what it meant. They wanted to get away. Their objective was they were trying to bring on the Messianic age by living lives of purity and meditation. Their lifestyle would have been a lot like those of the, of the monks in the monasteries that, that, we've, that we know of or have heard of. That would have been their lifestyle. They, we, we know also that they, uh, they were very uh, prolific at writing and copying some of the texts of the Old Testament scriptures. In fact, it's because of the Essenes that we have a lot of the, the Old Testament scriptures that we do have. Uh, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in the 1940s. Uh, the scrolls had likely been hidden uh, back in the time, around the time of Jesus, and they had been hidden in these caves so that they uh, wouldn't be lost if, uh, if the invaders came in and tried to get rid of those documents. Uh, and again, we owe that to the Essenes and their community and for what they were doing. It's likely that, that John was either one of them or had spent time in one of those communities. This idea of baptism that John brings to his message was one that was fairly common among the Essenes. In fact, they would get up every morning and their first act was to be baptized. They would be immersed every morning as a, as a, a way of purification and as a way of reminding themselves that they, that they needed to be purified from their sins and their effort was to lead a life of purity. It's what they wanted to do. It's where they wanted to be. So John's message included baptism, but it was also a message of repentance. And that, again, was, was in compliance with his, with his Essene way of, of looking at things, that everybody needed to get sin behind them. And if they could work towards purity, they could bring on the Messianic age. Of course, John knew at some point in time that the Messiah was, was eminent, that the Messiah was actually here. And in his message, he included the fact that Jesus, that this Messiah, and he would later name Jesus as the Messiah, was coming and had already come and was among them. Because of that, his message was urgent. Because of that, his language was harsh. Because of that, he didn't mince any words. He told them like it was, and he told them that they needed to be baptized and they needed to live a different life. It's interesting to note that as we read in the book of Luke what, what this John had to say uh, Luke gives us more information, more content of his message, particularly as it ap applies to the plight and the situation of the poor. And we'll talk about that more here in just a minute. When John was asked who he was, he simply quoted a passage from Isaiah chapter 40, saying, I'm the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. That's, that's, what he, that's, what he said that he, that's who he said he was. He quotes a passage in Isaiah that talks about the coming of the Lord. Talks about making ready for the Lord's appearance, much like you would a, back in those days. It would have been like a visit of a, of a king. That if the, the king sent an emissary ahead and said, the king is coming to visit your town, they would go about making the roads smooth. They would go about making everything like it needed to be so that when the king came, he would find things in order. 
And that's the kind of message that John was having with the Jewish people. Get your house in order. The king's coming. He's on his way. He preached a message of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, telling them that they needed to be forgiven and they needed to repent of what they were doing and live their lives differently. He was also a confronter of kings. And like all the prophets who were the confronters of kings, it got him in trouble sometimes, didn't it? When you confront someone in power and tell them that they're living wrong, they generally, especially when it's a despotic king or one that's in absolute control, they don't like that message. And King Herod didn't like the message that John had for him either when he confronted him about being married to his brother's wife and told him how wrong that was. Because of that, Herod's, Herod and particularly Herod's wife had it out for him. Uh, Herod put him in prison and then his wife fa- found a way to ask for the head of John the Baptist and because of her wanting that, John the Baptist was executed. But he also had the distinction of one who died for a cause. He died for a cause that God had led him into and one that God had given him. And uh, we can certainly honor his life because of all that he did. When we look at John's purpose and what it was about, again, we don't know a lot about John. Paul, a man named Paul Johnson wrote a book called The History of Christianity. And in that he said, John is likely the second most important character in Christian history. And yet, We don't know much about him. We know very little about him. I wonder if that isn't by design. I wonder if we don't know little about John because God had a purpose for John. And that John's singular purpose was to point people to Christ. Was to show who that Messiah was. That when people asked John, are you the Messiah? He would say essentially, no, I'm not, but he is. His objective was to point people to the Messiah. When Jesus came to be baptized, John shows us that that John the Baptist looked at him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. How did John the Baptist know that? We don't know. We don't know know if he and Jesus had been talking and gotten together on what they would say or if there was a revelation that he had from the Holy Spirit. We simply don't know how John knew that Jesus was this Messiah. Messiah. We knew that when, G, that when Mary came to visit Elizabeth, that, that John, who would have been in his mother's womb at the time, leapt for joy, Elizabeth describes it, because Jesus was there. And so even before birth, there was this kind of spiritual connection between Jesus and John. But when John sees him, he points to him and he says, there's the man. He's the man that, I'm, I, that I've told you about. He's the one whose shoes I'm not even willing to, to, to tie or untie. Because he's so much greater than I am. Many of Jesus' disciples were John's disciples first. Can you imagine what it would be? Just human nature, think about it. To have a group of disciples who are following you. Who you're teaching on a day-to-day basis. Who are gaining energy in following what you're teaching them. Striving to get some things done only to see them leave you and start to follow another teacher. Human nature says that's disappointing. Human nature teaches us that that's difficult. And yet when John was asked about it, he said, he must become greater, but I must become less. Why did he say that? Because of his purpose. His purpose was not to become great in and of himself. His purpose was to point others to Jesus, not to himself. So John taught this this baptism, and it's a baptism that's mentioned a number of times in Scripture. And in this baptism, the idea was was purification. It was to purify them from sins, but it also involved repentance. Baptism without even, our Christian baptism without repentance is just getting wet. And John taught that that if you're going to put on, if you're going to start living the way you need to live, if you're going to be baptized and have your sins forgiven, then it's logical that you're going to move forward trying not to sin anymore trying to live your life better after the baptism than you did before the baptism. People ask him for specifics. What does that mean for us? And it's, again, interesting that Luke points out that means you've got to treat people differently. And when Luke talks about Jesus' message, he talks about things like sharing sharing some of your clothing with others who don't have clothing. He talks about sharing your food. If you have extra food, don't just store it away. Share it with people who don't have food. 
If you're someone in a position of power, don't use your power to abuse other people. Treat them right. Be satisfied with what you make and where you can give to others. I think it's interesting to, so, to, to, to point out not only that Luke points that out, and again, Luke points that out because Luke, everywhere he can, wants to show us Jesus' sen- sensitivity, God's sensitivity to the plight of the poor and how important it is that we who claim to follow God are equally as sensitive to the plight of the poor, that we need to be people who are willing at every opportunity and at any occasion to share what we have with people who have less, with people who are in need with people who have nothing. One of the greatest things that Luke, that Luke shows us, that John pointed out and that Jesus pointed out, one of the things that when he talks about this idea of repentance, one of the greatest things they needed to change was their attitude towards the poor and towards the needy. The Pharisees had basically excused that by saying, well, if they would just live their lives better, they wouldn't be poor. God would be blessing them. And they had dismissed them as sinners, saying, I'm not going to help. I'm not going to enable that kind of lifestyle. Does that sound familiar? Anything we do today? Anything we hear today? I wonder if some of our repentance, some of the things we repent of, shouldn't be how we treat those who are underprivileged. I can speak for Tim and say probably so. That baptism that John taught was one that kind of led or translated into Christian baptism. John says, I baptize you with water. He talked about this forgiveness of sins. I have the one who's coming after me will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And now as we have a description of Christian baptism, we know that it's both, right? It's in water for the forgiveness of sins, but it also includes this gift of the Holy Spirit that comes with it. So we're baptized in water and in the Spirit. Jesus mentions that a number of times in his ministry too. The combination of the two, that combination then is found in Christian baptism, jumping off of this Essene Jewish purification rite, symbolizing a washing with water, forgiveness of sins, and, it's, and it takes on the new slant of, of being like Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection. And as we rise, we rise to walk in a new life, to be like God, to be like Jesus, repenting of our former way of life and seeking to live life the way God wants us to, being what he wants us to do. As we look at the end of John's relatively short life, we know that Jesus at the end pronounced on him a job well done. Toward the end of his life, he sends a couple of his disciples, a couple of his followers to ask Jesus, hey, Jesus, are you the one or are we still waiting for someone else? It appears John, toward the end of his life, there may have been some discouragement, some frustration there. He needed some some affirmation, and Jesus sent back with him the the message that he did. We don't know if he meant it to be cryptic or if it was kind of an inside thing between he and John, but he said, go and tell John what what you're seeing here. Go and tell John what's happening there. Lame people are getting up and walking. Blind people are regaining their sight, and dead people are rising to life. Somehow, the message to John was, I'm the one. In other words, you've done your job, my friend. You've done it well. In a lot of ways, the job that we're asked to do parallels the the job that John was asked to do. Not necessarily wearing camel hair outfits. That's good, I guess. Certainly not eating grasshoppers, which is even better. (laughs) Don't think I'd want to do that. But this idea of being people whose lives are about pointing others to Jesus... Now that's something, right? That's something we're asked to do. As we think about John the Baptist and how he, as, as a part of his life, as, as the definition of his life, lived to point other people to Jesus, we read and realize that we're called to do the same thing. It's not about people, Tim getting people to follow him. It's not about everybody seeing and doing things the way Tim does it. It's about the extent to which Tim, in his life, in his teachings, and what he does, can point out other people to follow Jesus. Saying, no, I'm not the answer, but I know one who is. I'm not the Messiah, but he is. To what extent does your life, sounds like an end of the sermon challenge here, and it is. To what extent does your life 
mirror that of John the Baptist? To what extent does your life point other people to your master, to your savior? To what, to what extent in your life are you, like John the Baptist, pointing others to the real light? It's our challenge, isn't it? It's what we're here to do. There's nothing more important in terms of our life as Christians, of living life each and every day, saying, I'm not the answer, but he is. I encourage you to take the opportunity at every opportunity to do that. Like Jamie said earlier, this time of the, this time, the season of the year, there may be even more ample opportunities as we're talking about the birth of Christ to do just that. I don't have all the answers. He does. I know him. Let me introduce you to my friend Jesus. If you're here this morning and you haven't been introduced to my friend Jesus, let me take this opportunity now. I'm not the answer, but he is. I don't have life, but he does. I can't bring you salvation, but he can. I can't guarantee you a life in heaven with God after this life is done, but he can. The invitation is set for you this morning. If you, don't, if you haven't embraced that life, if you're not living that life to be what Jesus wants you to be, if you haven't accepted him as your Lord and Savior and been baptized in this, in this ceremony that, that purifies you from your sins, that causes you to walk with Jesus from death to life into a new life, one that is blessed and honored by him and one that has the gift of the Holy Spirit, then today could be your day. As we head into this Christmas season, honoring God for the fact that he sent Jesus, he came in the form of a man to be what we could not be, that sacrifice for our sins. As we honor that, wouldn't it be awesome this morning if some of you said, my life needs to be different and put him on in baptism. We'd love to be here and help you with that this morning. It's, everything's ready. All you got to do is come and let us know that's what you want to do and we'll do it. If your life isn't being lived in, consistent, in a consistent manner with what we've talked about this morning, just pointing others to Jesus, that's something that you can repent of and change today too. Repentance has two angles to it. One is confession. Yeah, I've done some things that are wrong. And one is change. Yeah, I need to do better. It's not difficult to say. Sometimes it's difficult to do, but we're here to help you with that too. If you just need to pray with someone this morning, we've got a lot of people here who would love to do that. We'll have men standing around the auditorium. And if you want to go to them and pray right where you stand or find a room and pray, they'll do that with you. My wife and some other godly women are going to be in the, in the back and in the foyer. And if you're a woman and would rather pray with a woman, that's there available for you too. But whatever you need this morning, please, please, don't leave without knowing you've done everything you can to be what God wants you to be. That your life is simply pointing others to him. We're going to sing this song to encourage you to do just that. Stand, please, as we sing it.